church, let's stand as we get our time of worship this morning. We'll begin with the reading of God's word. Psalm 63. Oh God, you are my God. Early will I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh longs for you in a dry and thirsty land. There is no water. So I have looked for you in the sanctuary to see your power and your glory. Because your loving kindness is better than life, my lips shall praise you. Thus I will bless you while I live. I will lift up my hands in your name. Amen. Let's sing it this morning.
earth is full of his glory. And we're gathered here today. We're glad that you have came out for a time of worship. Hey, listen, if you're visiting with us, we'd love to have a record of your visit. Uh, just fill that out. There's a little tear-off section there. Fill that out and then drop it in uh, the offering plate uh, on your way uh, out after the service this morning, all right? If you would, uh, let's, let's continue to worship by going to the Lord in prayer. And this is worship, all right? Part of worship is taking time to pray and to seek His face as we come together to worship. So if you would, bow with me. Heavenly Father, Lord, may we slow down. Lord, may you have your will and your way in this service today. Lord, I pray that your glory would fill this place. Father, this morning I know that there are so many of us. We spend all week so busy. There's so many things to do. And we don't take the time to stop and to worship and praise you. So, Father, this morning. Renew our spirits. Lord, restore unto us the joy of thy salvation. Father, this morning, right here in this place, may uh, for, the, for the next few minutes, Lord, may we forget about all of the cares. May we tune out every distraction. Lord, may we forget about even the people that are around us, and may we simply gaze upon your beauty. Father, I pray this morning that we will not worry about the religious do's and don'ts when it comes to worship. And God, that we will be so in, enthralled with you, God, that we'll see your beauty. Lord, we'll see your holiness. And Father, this morning we will worship. Why? Because we just sing, God, that you are great. And God, you are awesome. We have so many reasons to praise you this morning. Most of all for your son Jesus. That sacrifice that he made upon that cross. Paying our sin debt. So Lord may we worship you here in this place this morning. In spirit and in truth. Fill this place with your glory. And it's in your name that we pray. Amen. Let's continue to stand and sing this morning.
ways not change at all. Chains 
Children's Head. Amen. 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 Children's Church, you are dismissed at this time. Take the Bible if you would and turn with me over to the Gospel according to St. Matthew, Matthew chapter 5. Uh, Matthew chapter 5. Can, can I just do something? I... I, I, I listen, folks. I'm trying to be obedient to the Spirit this morning. Amen. Brother Kay, you don't have to come up here because I'm not sure. I, I'm going to forget the words of this. Come on, brother. Listen. He's thinking, what in the world is going on? But if the Spirit's got this on my heart, we got to do this. Amen. I, I'm not quite done yet. When we've been there. Come on, sing it. Ten thousand Well, you ought to affect 
your world. You ought to affect the world in a positive way and in, 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 in the way that you live. And so this morning, as we look at shake and shine, well, I want us to look at how we are called to be salty saints, all right? Are you a salty saint? Look at Matthew chapter 5, in verse 13 now, Jesus says, You are the salt of of the earth. But if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. And then verse 14 is what we'll really focus on more next week, all right, where he says, you are the light of the world. So in these two verses, Jesus says, you are the salt of the earth and you are the light of the world. But I want you to notice here, when Jesus says, you are, in the King James, it says, ye, all right? Ye are the salt of the earth. Now, ye is one of those good southern words, all right? You understand the southern translation of ye, it means y'all, all right? I mean, you understand y'all, okay? Y'all are the salt of the earth. But notice what he says here. He says, you are. He doesn't say you ought to be. He doesn't say you could be. He doesn't say you should be or it would be nice if you were. He says, you are the salt of the earth. You see, we are to be like salt that penetrates and then we're to be like the light that radiates. And so in other words, we are we are to affect and not necessarily be affected. We are to be the thermostat and not the thermometer. We are we aren't to be followers of this world, but we are to be leaders to a different world. And so we're to be separated. We've been talking about this in our Sunday school class, all right? And let me just put a little plug in right there for Sunday school, okay? I mean, because I'm going to be honest, all right? Chapter 2 in our book was tough, all right? I mean, we're studying a book right now called Respectable Sins. Think about that for a minute. Respectable sin. Yeah, we're talking about sin in Sunday school, all right? But you know what we talked about in our Sunday school? That we're called to be saints. That, what, that if you're a child of God, you're a saint. And as a saint, though, there surely shouldn't be sin in the saint's life, right? And so, and we've talked about in our Sunday school that we're to be separated, that we're called out, we're to be different and not like the rest of the world. Let me give you a couple of verses, all right? Uh, 2 Corinthians 6, 17. Look at what Paul says, Therefore, come out from among them and be what? Everybody say separate. separate. That's what we're to be. Separate, says the Lord, do not touch what is unclean, and I will receive you. Romans chapter 12, verse 2, Paul says, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Now listen, separation is not isolation. Okay? It's not like you go be a monk in a monastery somewhere. Separation is not isolation, but rather it is insulation. Jesus said we are in the world, but not of the world. We live in the world, but the world should not live in us. Amen? Amen. There's a difference. So don't be conformed, but rather we are taking gospel and we are to confront the world that we live in. So how do we do that? Well, you've got to be the salt, and you've got to be the light. So the question is, are you a salty saint? Are you a salty saint? Did you know that salt is a miracle? I mean, come on. Who, who, who has to just pour a bunch of salt on their vegetables in order to eat? Yeah, I'm right here too, okay? Okay? I mean, I, I, I try to eat my green beans and my green peas, and that's about it, okay? But I have to have the salt on there, you know? But do you know salt's a miracle? Now, I'm going to share something with you. I almost failed chemistry class, Okay? I mean, I, I, chemistry just never really made sense to me in, in high school and in college, all right? I mean, high school, uh, I think the teacher just felt sorry for me, gave me a D to pass me on to say I passed <coughs> chemistry. College was the same way. I had to take one chemistry class in college, about failed it, but by the goodness and the grace of God, I passed it. But listen, though, did you know, I mean, you know, you know this, that salt is composed of two poisons. It, it is. Uh, chloride and sodium. It's sodium chloride, right? But see, separate, if you take either one of those and ingest it by itself, then guess what's going to happen? You're going to die. 
Okay? You, you're not just going to take sodium or you're not just going to take chloride, but when you put them together and you combine them, then you have common, ordinary salt. And so think about this. That which used to bring death somehow comes to bring together life, and that is a miracle. Th think about this. And that's how it is with the Christian life. In the Christian life, you know the Christian life, sometimes you get a little poisoned by sin. Even though you're a child of God, you get in sin and you're poisoned by sin. And so then death is looming in the shadows. But then it is confronted by the grace of God in his death. And when you put those two negatives together, they form a positive redemption. Yeah. The miracle of salvation. Uh, some of you may be familiar with this song. I never heard this song, all right? I had to look it up. But there's an old song, I think it came, back out, it came out in the 40s. And it goes, the chorus goes a little something like this. It took a miracle to put the stars in place. It took a miracle to hang the world in space. But when he saved my soul, he cleansed and made me whole. It took a miracle of love and grace. Amen. He saved me. And when he saved you by his grace, that's the miracle. You know, the greatest miracle of all is salvation. Amen. And that's a miracle that Jesus is still performing. So what does it mean? When Jesus says in Matthew chapter 5, verse, uh, verse 13, that you are the salt of the earth. What does he mean there? By calling his disciples the salt of the earth. Well, let, let me just say this. According to the Salt Institute. Did you know there's a Salt Institute? There really is. And according to the Salt Institute, there are over 14,000 uses for salt. So this morning, I'm going to briefly describe each one of those two, all right? I told you he's going to be here a while. Let me give you, I'll give you a few of them, okay? Number one is this. Christians, like salt, are of infinite value. Did you know that you're valuable? You, you, you're valuable to who? To God. You are precious in God's sight. And so Christians, just like salt, you are of infinite value. You see, in that day and time, salt was a necessity of life. And since it was such a necessity and a precious commodity, then there was a great value that was attached to it. You see, sometimes salt, and salt was so important that it was sometimes used for money. Could you imagine going to your job today or this week and the boss says, here's your paycheck and they hand you a bunch of salt? We'd say, that's nuts. I don't want to be paid salt. See, for us today, salt's common. It's ordinary, right? I mean, we have an abundance of it. But in that day and time, salt can be used as compensation. Matter of fact, where we get our English word salary comes from a Latin word which referred to the payment of the soldiers when they were paid with salt. So think about this. Uh, maybe, you've used, maybe you've used this expression. I, I don't think I've ever said this, but I've heard it. We use phrases when we say, well, someone either uh, is, or, or whether or not they are worth their salt. You ever heard that? A few of you have, right? They're worth their salt, or maybe they're not worth their salt, okay? But we don't think about it as much of, of salt, you know, being valuable because we have as much as we want. It's right there on the kitchen table, and we just pour it out as much as we want to on our, on our veggies, all right? But listen up. When you are completely dependent upon salt to preserve the food or as payment, as a salary, well, then guess what? It's valuable. And when you understand that, you get a completely different perspective on salt. Christians, children of God, you are of value in God's eyes. Number two is this. Christians, like salt, act as a preservative. Uh, you act as a, a preservative, all right? Uh, again, in that time, salt was important, not just as like a salary or a payment, but, but for survival, because in that time, that was the only way they could preserve meat. you, you got to remember, they didn't have their fridges and their freezers back then, right? Okay? I mean, they, they didn't have a way, the, the privilege of refrigeration. And so salt became very important in their ability to preserve food. And so they, they would take that salt and they, they would rub that salt in, into the meat there before they went to store it. Listen, listen, church. That says something about our society. 
Every single one of you are about to say a good, hearty amen when I say it's, I mean, it, it's right out there. We understand that it is rotting and decaying, our society is. It ain't getting better. You understand why? Because the salt has ceased being the salt. The Christian is not being the preservative. It's the child of God, the disciple, who is the salt of the earth. And we look around and say, man, just look at how society's crumbling. We've got to point the finger at ourselves and know. And we've got to say, well, we're, we're, we're the ones. We are the ones that are called to be the salt. And we're to be the preservative. And there is less and less salt that is being shaken in our society. And so because of that, then we see this downward spiral. I mean, listen, I don't have to tell you that there's a, a trend today. There is research. You don't need, I don't even know why they do research on this. But they do research on this stuff. You don't, need re, you don't need research to tell you this. That the average Christian in the average church is almost indistinguishable from the rest of society. In other words, you can't tell the Christian apart from the non-believer. They act the same. They talk the same. They do everything. They do all the sin. They, they sin the same. And so there's just seen, there's no difference. And so the fundamental moral and ethical difference that Christ makes in our life, it's missing. It's not there. Something is gone. The salt. We're to be a preservative. And so if we as Christians, we talked about it again in our Sunday school, that we're being more like Christ. Amen? Amen. That, that we're, we're, we're a, a little Christ. Okay? But Christ lives in us as a child of God and as a disciple. And so Christ lives in us. And, and when we are losing the qualities of the Christ likeness, then we're not making the impact in our society. And we become like society. We, we just become like everybody else around us. And we're not having that positive impact. And so instead of being a preservative, we become more of a hindrance. But salt, Christians, Christians like salt are to act as a preservative. And then the third thing is this. Christians like salt should promote thirst. Christians just like salt promote thirst. Uh, this past week, uh, uh, we, I, I, was, uh, I was taking, uh, we were going to school. Uh, I was taking Luke to school and, and we were going down the road and we didn't have breakfast, all right? And not that I need to eat breakfast, okay? But uh I said, let's get something a little different. And we end up over at Bojangles, all right? And, I mean, we don't do Bojangles all that much, but we end up over at Bojangles. And it just so happened, on their sign, it said, Country Ham and Biscuits, two for $3. Yep. Ooh, son. I love me a good Country Ham Biscuit. I, I'm confessing right now, all right? Wife doesn't know this until now, all right? I didn't eat, uh, I did eat, <laughs> but, uh, uh, but I said, I said, Luke, I said, have you ever had a country ham and biscuit? Because I didn't think he had. I mean, he's always a bacon and sausage kind of eater, you know, and, and he says, no, I don't think I've ever had a, a country ham and biscuit, and I said, I went that drive through. I said, give us two country ham biscuits, and give us some of those bowberry biscuits while you're at it, all right, you know, we, we, you got to have something in case he doesn't want the, you know, okay, and, uh, and so we, we pull over then, and I said, now, Luke, this is going to be your first bite of a country and a biscuit. Now, I, I kind of pull the fat off, all right? I'm not one to eat the fat on it, okay? But, but I pull it over, I put, we pull over, and I, I get the fat off, and I said, all right, here you go. Take you a bite of this thing. So he takes him a good bite of it, and he just said, ah, I, I don't really like that. I said, that's okay, I'm going to eat it, you know? That's, that's fine with me. I was hoping that's what you'd say. And, but then here's what he said, though. He said, he said, boy, that's awful salty. I said, exactly, it's country ham. That's the good stuff, all right? We don't want that city ham, okay? Yeah. Hey, listen. Salt makes you thirsty. Christians are to make Christ attractive. Christians are to make Christ desirable. Our job as a Christian is to make others thirsty for God. They ought to look at us and they ought to say there's something about you and it promotes a thirst. In John chapter 4, Jesus compared himself uh, to, to the Samaritan woman to have a drink of what? The fountain of living water. That's who he is. 
And I love what the psalm says. There is a fountain who is the king. He's the victorious warrior. And he's the ruler of everything. That's who God is. And that's who this world needs. The fountain of living water. But here's the thing though. We're not going to create that thirst. Our society, our community is not going to have that thirst for God unless they see that you are a salty saint. There's got to be some salty saints, all right? And when you are a salty saint, when you are walking to the beat of a different drum, whenever you as a Christian, whenever you go into a different setting, whether it's a workplace or a social setting, or whether it's down at Walmart, whatever it is, the unbeliever in you, they, they should see the evidence that Jesus Christ has made a difference in your life and they should look at you and they should say, I don't know what you have, but I want it. Christians, as salty saints, we ought to uh, develop and promote a thirst. Listen, you ought to stand out like a zebra in a herd of horses, all right? Or I'll give you one better, okay? You ought to stand out like a skunk in a perfume department. Yeah, some of you stink, all right? But that's how we ought to be. Well, what did we say? To be a saint, that means you're separated. It means you're called out. You're not like the rest of the world. And then when somebody notices, it makes them long, not for you, but for what you got. Amen. That you got Jesus. You, give it, you create that first. And let me give you another one. Christians, though, like salt, can lose their usefulness. Christians, just like salt, can lose their influence, their usefulness. Look in verse 13. You are the salt of the earth. It would have been nice if he stopped right there. But he doesn't. There's a but, right? But if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. Uh, in the King James, it says, if the salt loses its savor, okay? Flavor or savor. Now, in, in other words, if you as the salt or as the saint, if you're not as salty as you ought to be, in other words, you've lost the zeal, the zeal, the tame. Uh, you're just not there. And so, now listen, let, let me make sure you understand something. It doesn't, Jesus is not saying you've lost salvation. No. He's not saying that you've lost salvation, all right? We would say it like this. We would say it like David said it. David said, restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. When David found himself in sin, he had lost not salvation, he lost the joy of salvation. There's a difference. Jesus is not saying there that you've lost salvation. Here's what he's saying. If you are not a salty saint, you've lost your influence. You've lost your testimony because you're not salty. You're not influencing the world. The world is influencing you. Yeah. Can I tell you something this morning? Your life is either counting for God or you're making an impact for the enemy. Yeah. There's no middle ground. There's not. You're either living for God and living for good and, and it's the way that you live, the things that you say, the attitudes you entertain, the lifestyle that you adopt. It is continually producing either a positive or a negative result in society. Whether you like it or not, when you're a child of God, listen, you need, your life either counts for God or it counts against you. Remember that guy named Gandhi? Yeah, some of you, right? Remember Gandhi? There were some missionaries that went to Gandhi and they asked him. And, you know, they were over there in India and they go to him and, and they said, what is the greatest hindrance to Christianity in India? That's a good question. You know what his answer was? Christians. Ouch. That stage doesn't. It? That hurts. It's true. It's true, isn't it? Could we honestly say this morning the greatest hindrance to Christianity in 
Cookville, Tennessee or the Christians in Cookville, Tennessee? Because the Christians are not the salty saints that God says, you are the salt of the earth. Hmm. Let me give you another one. I know that one hurt. Let me give you another one. Christians, like salt, must make contact to influence this world. I think about this. I can, I can summarize this one real quickly, all right? I'm about done, okay? Amen. Salt is only good when it gets out of the shape. Y'all understand this is our shaker. You're in the salt shaker right now. Okay? You thought this was a sanctuary. It is. But this is the salt shaker. And every now and then, the only way that we are going to be effective and influence our city and our community and our county and our state and everybody that we come into contact with is for the salt to get out of the shaker. We don't want to get out of the shaker, though. We, we like our comfort zone. We do. I mean, we, we love our comfort zone. And, and, and we want to come in and we will say, well, boy, I went to church today and we had some good worship and the preacher was all right and, and we got out early and, and boy, and, and then we, we leave the shaker and we leave the shaker, but then we don't want to go in the salt. And we don't have the influence out there. We're hiding in here instead of going out and being the salt we're called to be. Y'all remember the Peanuts cartoons or comic strips, right? Uh, there, there was a, a peanut comic strip and it showed Peppermint Patty talking to Charlie Brown. And, uh, and Peppermint Patty, she says, guess what, Chuck? The first day of school and I got sent to the principal's office. Okay? And, and then she goes, she says, it, it was your fault, Chuck. And Charlie Brown says, my fault? How could it be my fault? Why do you say everything is my fault? And she said, well, you are my friend, aren't you, Chuck? And, and, and then she says, you should have been a better influence on me. <laughs> Preach! That's good. Peppermint Pat, now, you say, she's just trying to pass the buck. Yeah, she may be trying to pass the buck, but in a very real sense, she was right. You need to be a good influence on somebody. You need to show somebody this week what it means to be a Christian. To be a salty saint. To have an influence. You're going to have an influence. Hey, listen. That influence is either going to be good or bad. One way or the other. So we, we've got to get out of the shape to make influence. To be an influence. Can I give you just a couple more and I'll be done? You know what salt does? Salt irritates. It does. You ever get like a wound on you or something? And, I mean, just somehow salt, you know, gets on there? It, it, it irritates, doesn't it? Salt irritates. Can, can I just say this? That, that there are people out there where Christianity or, or they come in contact with a salty saint and because that, uh, that salty saint or that Christian, it rubs them the wrong way. Now, I'm not saying that you ought to go out there and be irritated on purpose. Okay? Some of you, that just come natural, all right? Okay? I mean, we, we just, we, we like to, sometimes we just purposely irritate somebody. But listen, though, we should not be surprised when this world says, well, you bunch of Christians, y'all just a bunch of irritated. Hey, that's a compliment. It's a compliment if you irritate somebody and you rub them the wrong way because you're just being a salty saint. Can, can I tell you one expression I learned from one of those ten sermons? Uh, these, these preachers, they all have their expressions, all right? And I just steal them all I do, okay? And one of them said this. He was talking about Rome, okay, the Roman Empire and the fall of the Roman Empire. And you know who they blamed? They blamed the Christians. And then here's what he said. Coming soon to a country near you. If we're alive in the days that this 
country starts to just get further and further and further in sin, guess who they're going to blame? You. The Christian. The salty saint. Who's living according to the truths of God's word. You're going to irritate somebody. They're not going to like you very much. Because you're a salty saint. And then the last one is this. Salt seasons. I, I could have started with this, right? You know this. I, I don't mind to eat green peas. I like green peas. But the only way I can eat my green peas is I've got to pour a ton of salt on it. Which is not good for me. I know. Uh, but that's what we do. You, we know that. We know that salt seasons. You understand what I'm saying here? As a Christian, we ought to go out, out of the shaker, and we ought to season society. We ought to, we ought to add some good flavor wherever we go. Wherever you go to work, that workplace ought to be a better environment. Because they say, well, look, here comes so-and-so. That's one of those salty saints. That's one of those Christians. They may not like it. And it'll make a better workplace. Kids, you go to school. And when you go to school, kids, you can make your school a better place by being a salty saint. Now keep in mind what I just said, though. There's some that ain't going to like it. You're going to put a target on your back for the enemy to attack and try to bring you down. Brother Caleb, you come. I'm going to say this, and as we prepare for a time of invitation, listen. To be salt, Jesus said, ye are the salt of the earth. <clears throat> to be salt, you don't have to be anything spectacular. That's good for every single one of us. I don't have to be special. I don't have to be spectacular. I just got to be salt. To be salt, I don't have to be something sensational. If I want to be salt, I don't have to be successful. To be salt, all I've really got to do is affect one little corner of the world. Wherever God places you, that's your corner. That's your spot. All right? I don't mean in here. I mean out there. Wherever God's put you, you go be that salt. You be one of those salty saints. Have you ever stopped to think what this world would be like if there were no salty Christians? You don't have to guess. Just turn to the book of Revelation. You read about it. You read about what happens when the Christians are out. When we're no longer here. And what really happens to this place. God's using you. You are the salt of this world. This morning as we prepare for a time of invitation, listen, the, the altar is open. I'll pray with you. You want me to pray with you? But I want to invite you to come. Maybe you just want to come this morning. You just want to say, Lord, I'm sorry. I'm not being that salt. I'm not being a salty saint. I know I'm a child of God. I know I'm a disciple. I know I'm your follower. But Lord, there's some sin in my life. There's some things in my life that don't line up with the Word of God. And Lord, I, just, I, I, I want to be that salt. I want to leave this shape different. I want to get out of the shape. And I want to go out there and I want to be the salty saint that you've called me to be. So I invite you to come. Altar is open. As we stand as we sing, would you come now?